The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Jerry Renault. Today I want you to grab a pencil, a pen, and some paper, and I want you to be able to write down some very important phone numbers and perhaps some websites, because today we're going to talk about scams and frauds and ways that you can help avoid being scammed or being the victim of a fraud. We have a very special guest, Ryan Sothan from the Nebraska Attorney General's Office, who is here to talk to us about that. You don't want to miss it. I'm Lena Powell Drake, and today we're going to honor two of the women who are among the 135 women who went to Washington, D.C. on the honor flight. We honor these women specially. Please stay tuned. I'm Sam Truax, and today on Live and Learn, my guests are going to tell us about the activities and the veterans organizations in the Lincoln area. Hello, I'm Bill Ainsley. Ageism affects older people and younger people. Today, we'll set you straight. Stay tuned. This and more on today's Live and Learn. This is an accumulation of letters in the home of my father-in-law. Over the period of a couple of months, two, three months. The envelopes started arriving in his mailbox when he was about 89 or 90. And they were festooned with pretty stamps from all over the world and official looking insignia. But of course, the best thing was what the envelopes contained, which were effusive letters of congratulations for having won contests and sweepstakes and lotteries all over the world. Hello, I'm Jerry Renault. Welcome to Live and Learn. Today on Live and Learn, we want to talk to you about that situation. We want to talk to you about scams and frauds and bad people out there trying to take your money. It's something that we are going to try to help you prevent. We have lots of good information for you today. So again, if you want to take a piece of paper, a pen or pencil, and write down some of these things, we think it would be to your advantage. And in order to help you, we have a very special guest from the Consumer um, uh, Division, uh, Consumer Protection Division of the Nebraska Attorney General's Office. Ryan Sothan is uh, joining us to talk about these things. Ryan, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a really serious problem. We saw the we saw the video there of all the letters and things that um, that people get and the scams and and giveaways and all those things. Um, I mean, this is this is a serious problem. A serious problem for. Nebraskans disproportionately so on our senior population. Only 19% of our state's population, but 35% of our complaints. Uh, I want to tell you about a new one, uh, just to sort of get started. This was one that happened um, to my wife and myself uh, just not too long ago, that we got a phone call from somebody saying, um, we can lower your phone bill. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with your local phone company, and so we can, we can cut your rates, and all you have to do is just sign up quickly, and away we go. Fortunately, we checked it out and determined that it was a scam, but that was a new one on me. That is a very good, very recent uh, example of an imposter scam where somebody assumes a persona uh, telling you a story to get you to believe that story and on the basis of it, take immediate action. It's known as cell phone account fraud and it is uh, preparatory even to identity theft. Well, I'm glad we were able to, <laughs> to resolve that and, and not have an issue. Let's talk about uh, some things and some ways that um, people can try to make sure that it doesn't happen to them. One of the things that I do want to talk about is this publication that it comes from your office. It's called Preventing uh, Senior Fraud. I think we have a, a shot of it right here. Lots of really good things and ideas and things for people to do to protect themselves. If somebody wanted to get a copy of this, what would they do? We would encourage them uh, to be in contact with us either directly through our toll-free number 1-800-727-6432 or on our website protectthegoodlife.nebraska.gov. Under our resources tab, we have a full copy of this available to be viewed online. Otherwise, request 
that a copy or multiple copies be sent to you, we're happy to do so. Fabulous. It's, a, it's really a great publication. I would encourage everyone to read it. We're going to go through some of the ideas that are in here. Great. And I'm embarrassed to say that I don't do them all. And so uh, it, it really is a good thing. It's got me thinking about a lot of these things. Good. Let's talk about uh, some of these things. The first one to me is, uh, and you and I have chatted about this before, it is perhaps the most important thing to remember is that if you did not originate this call, it's probably a scam. Yes, in fact, uh, if you didn't originate the call, do not give out the information because today, with 70% uh, of successful fraud contact being made through the telephone, and with telephones moving away from the old wire line to now the wireless and digital networks, it's terribly easy to spoof a telephone number, appear as if you're calling from uh, uh, the local exchange, and making the caller ID even register as some other entity. They might be probing for personal identifying information, which would include your social security number, your date of birth, maybe your Medicare number, the new MBI and you do not know that you are talking to uh, whoever they claim to be. So we want independent verification and only when you are convinced that you know who you are talking to, to then uh, be comfortable divulging the information. I, I have started, if I see something come in on my cell phone and I don't know what that number is or it's not a name of somebody I know, I'm gonna let it go to voicemail. That's a very good recommended practice as a matter of fact. If it's important, they'll leave you a message. If not, they're moving on. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, another one. This is an, another good one because we get a lot of people talking about um, they get a call from the government, but the government is not going to give you a phone call. Yes, imposter scams are where, again, the caller assumes the persona of uh, an entity. In this case, it's the government. And, and more often than not, it's going to be the Internal Revenue Service. It might be the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services or perhaps even the Social Security Administration. But uh, with popular ploys, with urgency implied, uh, or perhaps even an offer too good to be true, they're going to dupe you into divulging that, that personal identifying information. Uh, please understand, the government really doesn't reach out by phone. They reach out more formally by letter. So if anything is gonna come from the government, it's gonna be from a letter. If somebody calls you and says, we're from the government, that's not gonna I would be True. highly skeptical, and uh, in fact, I would go so far as to not believe that. Okay, very good. Okay, um, let's talk about some of the other things that are uh, really good signs um, that, is, that it's a scam of some kind. And uh, the first one is one I guarantee you, almost everybody has been taken in on this in some fashion, maybe not all the way through, but I'm just as guilty as anybody. If it sounds too good to be true, probably is. I think that could be the tagline for our consumer protection division because it's a, a, an age-old truism that uh, probably goes back generations. But uh, uh, offers too good to be true typically are, and examples of offers too good to be true, much like we saw in the opening with the letters, the prize patrol, the winnings, it's going to be offers of cash, prizes, uh, government grants, refunds, but sudden newfound wealth. And uh, again, we encourage skepticism because the offer that is too good to be true, truly is. Yes, I, I got one that offered me free airline tickets if I would show up at this event and go through this process. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say that we went to this thing and sure, they said they are free, but you have to do X, Y, and Z and you have to pay it out to do this. And it turned out to be just... There are always conditions attached right, to always. that offer too good to be true. Uh, and typically the condition that must be met is some type of uh, cash payment. Right. Okay, uh, another one, the sense of urgency. That's always, uh, and, and some people can get taken in by that. Absolutely. Uh, urgency is that uh, in order to claim your prize or to avoid the negative consequence, which is why the IRS scam is so popular, because if you don't make a payment today, you will likely be arrested by close of day. But uh, Urgency is to get you to do something not now, but right now. And what is it? It's to make that, that payment. So we consider urgency to be a red flag of a scam in the making. So if there is something that has to be done immediately, again, be skeptical and uh, uh, engage the left side of your brain as opposed to the emotional right side of the brain. 
and uh, don't take that action. It's really to your detriment. Yeah, and going with that urgency is that demand for money, is it not? That's sort of, again, one of those things. If somebody is demanding money and demanding money in an urgent fashion, be skeptical. Absolutely. There's, there's always strings attached. There's a need to uh, pay to play, uh, give to get, and that's just not the way things are, are, are done. And the, and the last thing in, in sort of this segment is um, one that you have to be so careful on, and that is they want some kind of personal information, and they're very good at asking those kinds of questions and seeming like, oh, this, I trust this person. I'll give them my social security number or I'll give them a checking account number or something. There, there's a lot to be said about that because the, of the four red flags, three typically come together. The offer too good to be true or too compelling to ignore, the negative consequence option. Uh, urgency applied and immediate payment required. That's to steal from you today. But if I can't steal from you today, I'm happy to steal from you tomorrow or down the road because I will be building a dossier, a profile of you through this relationship that I'm cultivating over the phone. And that relationship is where so many of Nebraska's seniors fall susceptible. Uh, isolation is one of the key factors behind uh, successful financial exploitation in victimization. Because uh, uh, there's loneliness, there's the desire to connect and communicate, and these scammers are outstanding at developing the relationship. And then along the way, dropping in questions such as, so have you always lived in this community? Where did you go to school? What was your high school mascot, etc.? And they're pulling from you cues that can even be password protects. So I'd be very, very oh, concerned about the stranger who becomes too uh, uh, close and too chummy too quickly. Right, and that sort of leads us into some of the things that uh, precautions that people can take. And, and one of these uh, I found to be very interesting, and that's not carrying certain kinds of cards with you that, that seem sort of natural, your Medicaid, Medicare cards, uh, but, you, but you say don't carry them. Uh, this is a, a concern to, to, to many seniors because we encourage them to be especially vigilant when it comes to protecting their personal identifying information. Again, a social security number, a date of birth, a Medicare, all of these are personally uh, identifying. And because they are at risk of uh, being given over to identity theft, we want the senior to be much more challenging when they are asked to provide that PII uh, and ask such questions as, why do you need that information? Will it be shared? If so, with whom? Um, what safeguards are you going to enact to prevent the unauthorized disclosure of this confidential information? And may I have a copy of your privacy policy, mm -hmm. please? That's, that's really uh, good information. And, and another thing that goes along with that is we all keep key personal information in our homes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think <laughs> probably just keeping them in a drawer somewhere is not the best approach. No, I think that you can find that, uh, well, first of all, with identity theft, 36% of the time it's a family member or relative. I, that's a frightening statistic. It is. And then another 14% of the time, taking us to half, it's a friend, a neighbor, or an in-home employee. Someone that you trust who comes into the home and then perhaps when your back is turned or you're out of the room violates that trust going through your personal effects. So we recommend keeping important papers with personal identifying information under lock and key, perhaps in a, uh, uh, a file that you would be able to purchase. Yeah, it doesn't purchase. have to be a big safe, right? No, uh, not a safe at all. Uh, there are files that are available at uh, uh, the local retailer, the Walmart, the Target, the Office Depot that you can get for 20 to a deluxe one for perhaps $50 that is going to keep the information secure and away from prying eyes. Fabulous. Well, before we run out of time, let's put uh, some addresses and phone numbers up on the screen if we could for people to, uh, because uh, if people think they've been scammed, your office is the place to call. Is that correct? We encourage reporting at all times because the senior market is so deliberately targeted and because underreporting is a, a serious problem, please reach out to us. We can handle the issue or connect you to the appropriate state government office that, that can. We're available toll free at 1-800-727-6432 via the web where you can file a complaint on online at protectthegoodlife.nebraska.gov. But don't suffer in silence. Reach out. Let us help you. Let us rally the resources. There's emotional recovery. There's financial recovery. Yeah, some people are, are hesitant to call. They're embarrassed about it. But 
don't be. They Nothing they to need be embarrassed to, about. Need to take that uh, that step and and make that call and uh, let's report it. Ryan, thank you so much for being uh, with us today. We have so much more to talk so about. I think uh, please come back and talk to us again. Happy to. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and always remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Legal services are a part of the spectrum of senior services available through our eight area agencies on aging. Attorneys can assist and educate seniors on consumer credit and debt collection issues, as well as help them plan ahead with advanced directives. Attorneys can also help seniors with consumer fraud and financial exploitation concerns, and also guide them through government benefit issues. For more information, contact the Elder Access Line at 800-527-7249. I'm Lita Powell Drake and today we're going to honor the women of the military who flew for, to Washington DC recently in September from Lincoln, Nebraska and this was to honor the women who are in the military. Everyone on the flight was female, including the pilots and we are so happy to welcome Lincolnites, Linda Plock and Valerie Kinghorn and they were participating in Desert Storm. We're going to be talk with you Linda first. now. You had an unusual situation because you did the maintenance on a helicopter, did you not? Would you tell us about that? Yes, I uh, am a helicopter crew chief, mechanic, and I graduated on December 13th, 1973, class 13 from Fort Rucker, Alabama. What prompted you to be interested in mechanics? It's unusual for a woman, I mean, I'm very proud of you for doing that, but it is unusual. I was mechanically inclined oh, to you start were. with. Can you fix my car? <laughs> no, but oh. I could probably fix your UH-1 helicopter. Oh. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Vietnam was going on and I was going to volunteer for a service anyway, and that opened up and I happened to go into it and I stayed with it. Well, when we asked the ladies when they were going to Washington, D.C. to take pictures, they both have taken pictures. And so I wanted to take a look at, let's look at some of your pictures first, the ones that were outstanding. I know you took a lot of pictures, yeah. but some were really meaningful to you. Let's take a look at the first one, and you can describe it. This is the Marine Corps War Memorial. It has a special meaning to me because my dad's younger brother, who played football for the University of Nebraska in the 1930s, was in a Marine Raider Battalion in the Pacific during World War Raising II. Raising the flag at Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima. That is so moving. That's and been there for a long time, hasn't it? Um, probably 1954. Yeah, that's out outstanding. And then there is a, a almost eerie feeling to the next picture of the soldiers in the field. What does that represent? This is one of my favorites, and it's the Korean War Veterans Memorial. There's like 14 Army soldiers, three Marines, uh, one Navy corpsman, and an air ground controller from the Air Force, and they're patrolling in bad weather. They have their ponchos on. These guys are about seven feet tall. Mm. They're wading through bad land. It's the first part of four parts of the uh, Korean War Memorial. There's a beautiful black wall to the left of them etched with pictures of people who were in the Korean War. And you could see the soldiers and yourself as an eerie we you see background. the capes that they had on, and it was raining, unfortunately, while you folks were there. Mm -hmm. So did you have a long cape, too, like they did? Uh, yeah, we had ponchos, <laughs> <laughs> see-through ponchos. All right, now let's take a look at the, at the white, unusual headstones. Those are um, some memorial headstones that are at um, Wayuka Cemetery, and Linda was out there when they were unveiling them, and they have just recently been placed there to honor the men and women who served in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And now I think one of the most moving thing, of course, is the wall. And so many people search for their neighbors or friends or loved ones' names on the wall. We'll take a look now, Val, uh, at that particular wall and maybe you could explain it to us. This is the Vietnam Memorial Wall and it is um, very impactful to watch somebody actually do a rubbing it's, it's pretty impressive because it lists, it personalizes 
every person that was that died during the Vietnam War, and it is very impressive that people are still remembering who those folks are and honoring them. Yeah, I was always concerned about the names that were way at the top, like how can you really see them, you know, if somebody wants to get a rubbing? They have people there that are willing to help look up names and also help you with those rubbings if you would need the help. All right. And Val, you went also to the Pentagon building. Would you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, with the Pentagon Memorial, it was um, a very interesting memorial. It was, it was neat because the moderator that was there, the guide was able to explain in detail as to what the memorial meant. In the picture, I'm standing by the year that I was born, which indicates the years of the folks that passed away. There's several benches that are in this memorial, and they're faced a certain direction with, the, with their names on it to determine if they were a person that passed away in the American Airlines Flight 77 or if they were in the Pentagon when they passed away. The memorial is set up by age, so the first bench is the youngest person that was that died in that 9-11 attack and it was a three-year-old girl she was with her family so her family's names are also etched underneath the oh. bench and then you have a big break in time frame because there were no teenagers on the flight or in the pentagon uh -huh. when the attacks occurred and then it turns into the young 20 year old and that most of those folks the benches faced the direction of the pentagon because those were mainly service people that passed away none of us will ever forget 9 11 that was a terrifying day and it's amazing that the, they got the pentagon back i mean they've got everything the buildings now looks like it hasn't been torched as it was in that particular time and then we had an elderly woman, 98 years of age. Uh, was she from Lincoln, Edith Peterson? Is she from Lincoln? She's from Sioux City. So, oh, Sioux City. That's wow. where she's at now. Um, she was very impressive. She was fun to watch. Um, she conducted a lot of interviews while she was on this flight. Um, in this photo, she was in front of the Iwo Jima Memorial, and she was talking about how her husband was there when the flag was raised and how they have a... How the flag was raised in Iwo Jima? Yes, oh her husband was goodness. there at that time, and she was also a World War II veteran, and she said that um, they actually have a statue on their TV stand of the Iwo Jima Memorial. And so she was talking about how he's passed recently, but it's one thing that she really honors a lot. Oh, excellent. And of course, we can't forget Loretta Swift from MASH. Um, uh, you had the good fortune to interview her. She was on the plane. Uh, tell us about her, will you? She, um, very involved, has a lot of different passions, and military people are one of her passions that she has, and also rescue animals. So her recent project is to reunite service members that have been injured and are in the process of coming back home and trying to get them reunited with their dog that they had while they were overseas. Uh, did she react? Did anybody call her Hot Lips Houlihan? Um, not that nobody I know of. Nobody said that? <laughs> not There's that Hot Lips Houlihan. No. Mm -hmm. Nobody said Loretta. that? There's Loretta. I'm shocked. Because <laughs> I had the opportunity to interview her, you know, several times. <laughs> and so we always called her Hot Lips. She didn't, you know, <laughs> she wasn't negative about that. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Um, and the guy who put all this stuff together uh, lives in Omaha. And, uh, and he gives a heck of a lot of credit because there have been many, many flights and hope that there will be any more. So we put kudos to Bill Williams and his wife Yvonne. I think she was the one who originally suggested this. And they live in Omaha and Patriotic Productions, they have produced that. Now he had said to me, because I thought that this might be the last flight, and he said, well, maybe not. Don't say it's the last flight because we're going to try to have some more because I think people will still be interested in this. Uh, there's going to be a book coming out if you're interested. Um, uh, it, it, we've, we've got, we can show you the cover of the book. I don't know if it's completely finished, but it's got all of the memories, you know, of the people who have been there thus far. Uh, you could go online uh, to Patriotic Productions. The, uh, and actually, the, the, the flight started back in 2008, 
So they've had a real commitment, you know, mm -hmm. to, to honor the people who have been there. And so the, the, the book that's coming out is uh, 200 pages, but there's going to be over 700 pictures. And this is going to be released uh, sometime, you know, sometime in the future. So if you're interested, you might want to go to www.patrioticproductions.org. That's patrioticproductions.org. Okay, now, just, uh, you know, to wrap up, what to, what to you was the most significant thing that you experienced while you were there in the rain? I think um, all of us being there together. And we didn't care if it was raining at all. You know, we got to meet new people and we got to reunite with older folks that we have not seen for years mm -hmm. and see things that we never would have seen before. Mm -hmm. And I how about you, them. Val? I think it was great that we were all together, but every time we went to any particular place, got off the airplane, did anything, we had a huge welcoming committee. Mm -hmm. And these folks really appreciated everything that we've done and thanked us for our service. And it was very touching. You're not in the military anymore. No. <laughs> Retired. <laughs> Retired. Well, <laughs> of the experiences you had, it quickly, what was the most significant for you while you served? Being in the war. Just being in being it. Being in the war and doing my job. And Val, what about your military experience? When we were in Desert Storm, it was a very unique experience. We moved around a lot and we would experience these dust storms where you couldn't see more than like <laughs> a foot in front of your face. And so at our final locations, um, a lot of folks got together and we built paths with rocks so we could find our way to the restrooms um, in the middle of the night if we needed to go or if it was in the middle of a dust storm. So we kind of had some, it was, it was an experience where it's not today where we have technology. There weren't <laughs> phones there. Yeah. And we went back to the very basics of living while we were there living in tents. Well, we sure appreciate your contribution to our country and the service that you provided. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn to honor our veterans. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. I'm Sam Truex, and today on Live and Learn, my guests are Lyle Bartles, the commander of the Nebraska American Legion, and Tony Antoine, the commander of Lincoln VFW Post 131. They're here to tell us about those veterans organizations and the activities that the organizations do. Lyle, tell us about the Lincoln Area Posts and what it takes to be a member of the American Legion. Well, in the Lincoln Area, almost every small community, every small town has a post. Not quite all, all of them, but most of them do. And uh, the American Legion is a veteran service organization that was chartered by Congress. So we have certain membership rules and eligibility requirements. These uh, membership dates are approved by Congress, so we can't just change them automatically. We have to petition Congress if we do want to change our eligibility dates. But the dates have been open for all veterans since 1990 because we've been in conflict since then. So uh, we have a pretty good pool of veterans that we can ask to join our organization. Yes, it's, yes, it's kind of have to be honorably discharged in a certain period of time, basically, is the membership that is requirements. Correct. and so. Well, how about the VFW, Tony? What are the what are the posts and the requirements here? In well, there's uh, I'm commander of post 131 here in Lincoln, and there's five posts in Lincoln, and we have quite a few posts around the country. Uh, in Nebraska, we have if I may reference this here, we have a 129 posts, and we have uh, 15,506 members 
in our own district here, District 9, we have 14 posts and we have a little over 1,500 members. And our requirements are a little more restrictive than what the Legion are. You have to be a member of a foreign war to be a member of the foreign war. Yes, you have to. Again, they have specific periods right. when we had when the country was in conflict and you had to be in those foreign locations during that conflict That's period correct. in order to qualify. So, well, how about your roles in operation of these posts, Lyle? What do you Well, my role in my local post is that I've I've held most of the offices, you know, commander yes. and treasurer and vice commander and all this and and uh, so uh, I, I still am an active member of that post and, and help them with all their activities. And, and the other posts around the area now serving as state commander, I'm invited to a lot of different posts to partake in their activities. And, and so I'm pretty busy traveling around. I'll bet the you are. I'll bet you are because there's a lot of posts. I think, see, Tony says there's 129. I'm, I think there's more Legion posts. We have there. about 350 posts 350. and, well, and yes. about 30,000 members in the state yes. of Nebraska. Yes, about twi well, twice, as, twice as many as the VFW, yeah, right. which is logical because a lot of veterans weren't in a foreign location right. <laughs> during the war. But they right. still can be in the Legion as well as the people who want to serve the community and the, are not veterans, they can go in the auxiliary, right? That's correct. And the Sons, Sons of American Legion, SAL, has... The Sons of the American Legion is getting stronger every year. It, it we is. have a, a good, strong Sons of the American Legion program in the state. And another program that we've started statewide in the last number of years is the American Legion Riders. And uh, this is a good program to... Uh, entice a lot of younger veterans yes. to join. Yes. And uh, they do a good job uh, escorting funerals and this type of thing. And, they and do. They get, they the get good publicity in that, in as much as they're with the veterans' funerals and other activities that get on the press. Right. Know, so. they, they're a good public relations activity yes. for the American no, Legion. I'm not familiar, Tony, with the fact that there's some auxiliary, you know, the VFW has the auxiliary, which right. is generally the ladies that support the community and the veterans, but right. they don't have the equivalent to the Sons of the Veterans. No, we don't not, have the Sons yeah. of the yeah, sons uh, of VFW, VFW or anything like that. But. but we do have an auxiliary as legions. They have auxiliaries. And, uh, yes. and you also they've have changed it from the ladies' auxiliary to the auxiliary, and we do have quite a few... Uh, oh, men who are members of the auxiliary. Yes, because if they're a son or daughter, or yes, or and grandson or whatever, brother, they're sister, just they interested in the serving the community to some degree, right. you know, right. as the so. Well, the impression of many people are that you know the VFW and the Legion are just little buildings in the community where you go and drink and and talk, you know, but. The organizations do quite a bit more than that. So, like Lyle, can you review some of the things that the Legion does for the community? Yes, I think I can. Uh, unfortunately, uh, s the impression some people have is that the American Legion is what you said, uh, beer, bowling, and barbecues. Yeah. But it goes a lot farther than that, uh, especially in our smaller communities. Uh, that American Legion post, that building is a focal part of the communities. It's used for everything from... Uh, land auctions to wedding receptions to public meetings you know and uh, the American Legion is is very strong we uh, emphasize going into our schools and teaching the students flag etiquette and teaching them about what the veterans did and uh, so uh, we're an integral part of our schools in most of our communities and and the American Legion is is I, I don't know what some of these communities would do without the American Legion. Yes. yes. And as far as state and national, essentially the Legion sponsors the baseball for the Legion, Legion ball in the summer. And they also have girls' state, boys' state for the government to train the kids in. So that's all sponsored by state and national. That is correct. The uh, the state of Nebraska has the third most 
American Legion baseball teams of any state in the Union. Wow, and that's, that's something to hang our hat on because our population is. is not as great as a lot of yes, states. But we absolutely. have a very strong American Legion baseball program. We also have a oratorical program with uh, good scholarship capabilities for, for high school students. And uh, we, uh, for the younger children, we have uh, Halloween parties and Easter egg hunts and it's just that's just about doesn't end what we try to do for our youth. That 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 is great because it's getting a little more publicity in as much as the Legion and the VFW both are orienting a little bit more to families, so that the younger veterans can bring their families and go on an Easter egg hunt, for example, or something that 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 is more interesting to them than it would be to some of the older veterans. So, and how about you, Tony? You got any? Well, the VFW, we uh, also have a scholarship program. We have a Patriots pin for grades 6, 7, and 8. And then we have Voice of Democracy, which they write, and then they do an oracle, oral uh, presentation on KSAT, and that's from 9 to 12 grades. And we also have an art project for all ages from kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, we also recognize teachers, firemen, law enforcement, EMTs, teachers. Uh, we recognize those uh, in scholarships. They can get yeah. up to thirty thousand dollars at exactly. national and level. Exactly, I think that scholarship for both organizations. Right. The scholarship is is a good help right. to the community and may entice some younger people to be interested in the Legion and the VFW. We also have uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scout uh, awards for that at post district and department national level and participate in that. Get a lot of good well, participation what, in what that. What does seem to be the most popular activities in the Legion, for example, what do you think people are most attracted to there? Well, in, in our particular area, the most, uh, our fundraisers, we have brunches and dinners and uh, very well attended by both veterans and non-veterans alike and several communities are represented there. People from different towns yeah. come and, and so that's a popular thing. And, and then again, our school programs are, are popular and, and the kid, the youth programs are good and, and the younger veterans, we try to uh, incorporate them into our post uh, we, uh, we uh, tell a lot of younger veterans, you know, the GI Bill was integral in writing the, the, the Legion was integral in writing the GI Bill. Yes. And of course the GI Bill is an expensive thing. It costs our government a lot of money to educate these veterans. And so some of our leaders in Washington would, would like to cut that down. And, and we keep a close eye on that and make sure that that GI Bill is there for them veterans. And we, we tell the young veterans, if if you want an education, that's great, but, but let our voice be your voice and, and keep these benefits, you know. That's it, number one, to do that. number one, where both of the organizations kind of is look out for the veterans' interests, right. but that, that spills over into the community in both cases, you know, where, where what, do you, what about you? I know that same with, with well, the BMW, uh, those potluck meals get a lot right. of attendance. Yeah, we had potluck for our post members, and. Uh, well attended, I thought. Uh, one thing we do, our mission is to help veterans. And like Lyle said, uh, the VFW, Veterans Foreign Wars, they were integral and part of uh, getting the GI Bill passed and increased and changed and modified. Yeah. Uh, in 2017, the VFW, they helped over 101,000 veterans receive $7.8 billion in benefits that they was entitled yeah, to. That's it. The organizations have to continue to pressure Veterans Affairs Department, for right. example, because a lot of the veterans do need medical help. And, and, and the Veterans Administration does do a lot for veterans. Yes. Uh, the VFW and the Legion, the DAV, Purple Heart Society, all are geared to help veterans and veterans families. Well, Tony, Give us an example of some of the fundraising that uh, organization does, either organization. One thing we do is Buddy Poppies. They were started back in after World War I, and we use that 
to raise money for veterans and needy veterans and their families. We also use that money to help support the National Home, which is for veterans and veterans' families or their widows. I usually end my interviews by recommending that our viewers get involved in what we're talking about here. Now, there's many veterans in our viewing audience that could look into joining these organizations and getting more involved in the community. So that's the recommendation that we need to come away from this interview with. Now, I'd like to thank my guests, Lyle Bartles of the American Legion and Tony Antone of the VFW for being our guest today and telling us about these veterans organizations. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn or to join the VFW or Legion if you qualify. Legal services are a part of the spectrum of senior services available through our eight area agencies on aging. Attorneys can assist and educate seniors on consumer credit and debt collection issues, as well as help them plan ahead with advanced directives. Attorneys can also help seniors with consumer fraud and financial exploitation concerns, and also guide them through government benefit issues. For more information, contact the Elder Access Line at 800-527-7249. Hello, I'm Bill Ainsley, your host for this segment of Live and Learn. Ageism can be a real downer for the young and old in our society. Some people make the wrong assumption that because of age, a person must do things this way or cannot do certain things. We're going to set the record straight today and make it evident that age is not the deciding factor in what one can accomplish. With me today to discuss ageism is Dr. Julie Masters. She's the chair of the gerontology department, which is part of the College of Public Affairs and Community Service at UNO. Dr. Masters, I want to welcome you to Live and Learn. Please tell us a bit about the purpose of your program. Certainly. Well, first of all, Bill, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And thank you to Aging Partners for their very generous invitation. I'm, I'm most grateful. I am with the Department of Gerontology through the University of Nebraska, Omaha. We offer courses on the Omaha, Lincoln, and if you will, the online campuses. Um, so we have classes at UNO, UNL, and also available online. We offer a multitude of degrees, including a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and a PhD in gerontology. We also offer a minor that's available at UNL and UNO, and then a certificate that students can pursue in Omaha, Lincoln, uh, UNK, as well as through the Medical Center. So what exactly is ageism, and does it only apply to older people? Certainly. So ageism was first coined by Dr. Robert Butler in 1969. And what Dr. Butler said is that ageism would be the prejudices and stereotypes applied to someone based solely on their age. However, what we know is that ageism isn't solely um, impacted by the aging population, but rather younger people can also experience ageism. When I spoke with you earlier, you mentioned some stereotypes noted by Edith Stein. Mm -hmm. For example, older persons falter for a moment because they are unsure of themselves and are immediately charged with being infirm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. When, when Edith Stein first wrote this, um, and this has been several decades ago, um, people might have been charged with being infirm because of uh, driving or, or something of that sort. But today, in a technologically driven society, uh, someone may be operating at a rather normal pace, but because we're so used to speed and mechanization of things that if people don't respond at a, a rapid-fire pace, we think that something's wrong, when in fact they may be just doing, uh, responding a very normal way. So older persons are constantly protected and their thoughts interpreted. You know, sometimes, particularly if people have memory issues, uh, very well-meaning, well-intentioned family members might try to fill in the blanks for them, or a spouse might do the same thing, um, rather than just giving the person time to think and process. And we don't know why that person might be uh, a little slower in terms of processing, so we have to um, develop a little more patience to allow people to express themselves. 
-hmm. Older persons are expected to accept the facts of aging. You know, I think it's interesting, and as you and I were discussing this earlier, the facts sometimes can really be myths of aging, that we think that certain things that happen have to happen because a person is aging, not necessarily. Um, aging has a number of benefits, a number of things that really can enhance the life cycle, and so thinking about the benefits can be of great value. Older persons miss a word or fail to hear a sentence, and they're charged with getting old, not with hearing difficulty. You know, isn't it curious that we live in a time, and I had mentioned about uh, technological advances and things of that sort, we have younger people, and I see this on campus, that have earbuds in and they have their music playing rather loudly. And what they will eventually do is um, impact their hearing to, to a degree that they will also have problems with hearing, that it becomes necessary to repeat words or repeat sentences and so forth. But it's curious that we don't get terribly frustrated with younger people. We do with older people. And somehow we have to change our thinking to not look at the person's age, but look at the challenge that the person might be having in terms of receiving information. I know in my case, if I say the same thing to the same person about three times, I start to get a little bit irritated with mm -hmm. them, and I need to work on that. So older persons are called cranky when they are expressing a legitimate distaste with life, as so many young do. Well, I think, first of all, we have to talk about crankiness, and there's something called continuity theory. So what I was when I was young tends to carry over as I age. So some people have been cranky all their lives. They just have gotten incredibly good at it. Whereas for um, other people that they may be experiencing something that should be corrected, should be addressed. And who better to seek out advice or opinions about the aging experience but someone who's living it. And so if there is something that uh, is problematic, looking to aging adults for their opinion uh, can be most valuable to society as a whole. So let's talk some more about the stereotypes and attitudes that some folks have, mm -hmm. not everybody, but some folks have about older people. That is illness. Older people are sick and disabled. If you look at the aging experience through the lens of the medical model, and your only experience with older people would be in nursing homes or healthcare settings, it would be easy to see where someone could come to that conclusion. And yet, when you ask older people how would you rate your health, most would say that their health is good, very good, and in some cases, even excellent. It's about providing examples of older people who are aging well and aging successfully. And we have impotency. No longer have sexual desires, and if they do, there's something perverse or abnormal. The desire to, to love people and to have people in our lives and to express that doesn't, doesn't change with the aging process. What what is interesting to me is that when you see the advertisements on television and radio and so forth for different prescriptions and products that can enhance the expression of how someone feels toward another person would suggest that at least in the 21st century aging people are are not going to take that as the final solution rather that they see there's an opportunity and ways to express their feelings for another. A friend of mine used to say that sometimes something is so ugly that it's ugly, so that leads us to ugliness. Beauty is associated with youth. Well, I think we can somehow uh, give credit to marketers and advertisers who have falsely assumed that the people with the greatest disposable income are younger people, but actually the people with the greatest disposable income are older people. And so if I want to sell a given product, I have to rethink how I am uh, promoting that particular item or whatever it is, um, product or, or um, um, device or whatever that might be. And, and incorporating more older people in advertising I think can be beneficial. Um, when we hide older people from the general public, is it any wonder that we think that aging is not beautiful? 
but when we can include older people, whether it's in advertising or in television programming or anything, um, that we can see one good examples, wonderful examples of the beauty of aging, then our understanding of aging will change. Mental decline. Mm. Learning and memory are impacted beginning in the middle years. Here's what's curious. Unless there's some, something that is of a pathological nature, most people will continue to, to learn up until the last days of their lives. Learning doesn't learning the the ability to learn doesn't change how we learn how we how we um, process information may change but we don't learn the we don't lose the capacity to learn in a similar fashion memory and there are some changes with memory and there's actually some enhancements with memory that occur as a function of age so giving people the opportunity to to learn new ways of Processing information can enhance memory um, and can enhance learning overall. Mental illness. Mm -hmm. Older people are senile. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because if you pull out a dictionary, and I'm going to old school say in paper form, and look up the word senile, senile just means old. It has nothing to do with a person's cognitive functioning. I think the good news, and I've been in the in gerontology for 30 plus years, I've been teaching for 30 years, um, what we're starting to see is that the word senile is slowly getting out of our language, out of our everyday communication. In other words, are, are coming in that are probably a more accurate description of what's taking place. And then isolation. Older people are lonely and isolated. I think that's true for some. Some older folks are lonely, some people are isolated. But we are seeing a new trend that isolation and loneliness isn't something that's limited to an older population, but rather people of all ages are experiencing loneliness and isolation. So there's a great opportunity to find a way to engage older people in discussions with people of other generations so that we can begin to address isolation for all age groups. What about poverty? people residing at or below the poverty level? So there was a time and when Edith Stein first wrote uh, her work on ageism and Robert Butler as well, his coining of the word, there were more people in poverty than there are today. Programs like Social Security, other programs that are available, for instance through um, Aging Partners is a great example, have helped to reduce the, the effects of poverty in aging adults. Then depression. The idea is that the majority mm. of older people are depressed. You know, it, I think it's interesting too that, that we think that if a person ages, it's natural to be depressed because why wouldn't you be depressed because you're, you're an older person? But what we know is most older people do not experience depression. There are some that do, and if they do, there are different avenues, different treatments to address that depression. Uselessness. Mm -hmm. Older people are unable to continue working. You know, I think we have wonderful examples in the state of Nebraska of people who have helped to dispel the myth of uselessness. You think about someone such as Warren Buffett or Dr. Tom Osborne or Lita Paul Drake, your colleague. Um, people who continue to make contributions in extraordinary ways. I think as a society, and particularly as we see this growth in the aging of the population, we have to work harder to find ways for people to continue to contribute. And continuing to contribute might be through work, through volunteering, um, through programming just like this. Again, what can we do to, to allow people to continue to share their gifts? Then there's isolation. Right. Older people are lonely and isolated. So I think there are some older people that are lonely, some people that are isolated, but we are living in a time where younger people are also lonely, also isolated, um, finding themselves feeling neglected. And so, you know, I think one solution, and it tie into uselessness, but one solution is to engage the two generations together. I have a colleague in Omaha, Dr. Lynn Holly, who's done beautiful work with intergenerational programming. We could enhance that 
and make great strides to addressing loneliness. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, even though we have some more material to cover. So sure. I, I want to say thanks to Dr. Julie Masters, the chair of the gerontology department at UNO for being with us today. If you would like more information on ageism, you may contact her at jmasters at unomaha.edu or call at UNL 402-472-0754 or at UNO 402-554-3953. Dr. Masters, thanks again. Bill, thank you and thank you to Aging Partners for this opportunity. I'm grateful. This all goes to show that no matter how young or old you are, it's never too late to live and learn. <music>